This channel is part of the History Hit Network. Stick around to find out more. The plain of Thessaly in the centre of Greece is thought to be the site of the earliest habitation in this ancient country. Its geographical formations standing as a forest of stone have made it unique down through the ages. It was here in classical times that the famous doctor of antiquity, Asclepius, lived and treated his patients. In the 11th century, some hermit monks started living in the caves and ledges on the sides of the stone formations. Until by the 12th and 13th centuries, this area, now known as Meteora, became a major centre of monastic life. We don't really know when monks withdrew from their normal lifestyle and came to live by themselves here in Meteora. The first monks to do so, however, lived very simple lives. They built rough shelters on the sides of cliffs and lived there for up to 40 years completely alone. Only on Sundays and on major feast days would they come down to celebrate together, although it's believed that some didn't even do this. For a hundred years, monks lived in isolation. But eventually, some of them got together and organized themselves into retreats. The first monastery built on top of one of the rock pillars was built by a monk called Athanasios. The monastery was built on a rock known as Platydithos, 431 meters above the floor of the valley. He called the rock Meteora, meaning in the air. Eventually, the whole area became known as Meteora. 
But what do these monasteries here at Meteora in central Greece have to do with the life of the Apostle Paul? We can't help but admire the dedication, faith and engineering skill of the monks who built these monasteries over 550 years ago, but this is not the life that Paul wanted us as Christians to live. This is a life lived away from the world. Paul was very much part of the world. Wherever he went, he mixed it with the best of them. He went straight to where it was happening. In this episode, we're going to look at Paul the philosopher. Paul the man who debated, argued, talked, pleaded and preached against the prevailing philosophies of his time. What he said will help us not to be afraid to face the current worldview, but to approach the world head on, knowing that the gospel is not philosophy, but truth. This calf area is called the Ignatia. It's the most appropriate name because the Ignatian Way was the great Roman road that used to run from Constantinople right across Macedonia, Greece, through Yugoslavia, and eventually down into Rome. The Apostle Paul travelled the Ignatia Way when he wanted to move through Macedonia down into Corinth. Today, these car ferries move right across the Mediterranean in every area, bringing passengers all to the Piraeus and from the Piraeus up into Athens and Corinth. And that's where we're going, because the Apostle Paul wanted to come to Athens. Athens was the university capital of the world. It was the center of all learning, of culture and philosophy. And it was to the center of learning and philosophy that Paul was to come to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is Athens, most beautiful city in the world. When the Apostle Paul came here in the first century, it was already one of the most beautiful cities of all. It was the home of the great classical philosophers. In her streets walked people like Plato and Socrates, great builders like Agamemnon and Pericles, and of course, historians like Herodotus and Thucydides. It was into this city, the intellectual capital of the world, that the Apostle Paul came. Already by the first century BC, there was a certain deadness about the Athenian philosophy. But you would never have guessed it the day Paul arrived in all the bustle and busyness of the agora or the marketplace. <laughs> 
and Paul came into the Agra, there was a great deal of bustle and hustle as people bought and sold and argued and disputed together. Then he travelled up here into the Royal Stoa. Philosophers had gathered here for centuries. It was in these beautiful colonnades that Socrates and Plato and Aristotle had taught their followers. There were a group of philosophers here at the time who used to hold onto the edges of their gowns and walk through the colonnades here teaching their students as they followed and flocked round about called the peripatetics. They were philosophers on the walk. When Paul came to this royal stoa, he was a philosopher on the run. There were two schools of philosophers strong at the time. The first were the Epicureans, the followers of Epicurus, who used to teach just down in the Lyceum. He lived from 342 down to 270 BC. And Epicurus taught that a person would have full pleasure if he followed every virtue. However, that teaching degenerated, particularly under the Romans, into a hedonism, a sort of, uh, as Paul described it, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die philosophy. The second group of philosophers were the Stoics, named after this Stoa. They were followers of the teaching of Zeno, who came from Tarsus, which was the hometown of Saul. And they taught that the most important thing was not the body, but the mind, the wisdom and reason behind everything. And Paul described them when he used the phrase, the wisdom of this age. Well, when Paul came here, the philosophers scoffed at him. In fact, they used a term, a spermologos, a sparrow who picked up crumbs of wisdom. The philosophers didn't dispute Paul's content, but he didn't have the form of rhetoric of a proper orator. However, he was teaching about Jesus and what he called anastasis, resurrection. And this was new. And so they invited him to come on up to the council of the Areopagus to tell them some more. So the members of the council of the Areopagus brought Paul up here to the top of Mars Hill and asked him to speak to them about this new God. Paul immediately started by declaring that God was right in the heart of Athens. I perceive, he said, that you Athenians are very religious people because as I marched along I noticed many fine temples and gods and idols set up and I even found one addressed to the unknown God. This unknown God is the one I want to speak to you about. He said, the gods I speak about are not made with hands, such as in these temples and idols. And obviously he was making some reference to this magnificent Parthenon. But, he said, God is spirit. And in saying that God was spirit, he caught up the response of the Stoics. And saying that God was self-sufficient, he caught up the response of the Epicureans. Smart man. He now had the leading philosophers agreeing with him. And this God, he said, in your own city, wants us to seek after him and find him. And here Paul made a very strong statement. For from one man God has made all the nations of the earth to dwell. Now the Greeks believed they were Greeks and everybody else were barbarians. But here was Paul telling them that God made of one blood all nations how some nations on earth need to hear that message today and this god we must seek after because paul was saying as longfellow put it that we believe that even in savage bosoms there are longings and strivings and yearnings for the good they comprehend not and that feeble hands and helpless groping blindly in the darkness touch god's right hand in the darkness and are lifted up and strengthened 
That right hand of God came among us, Paul says, in Jesus. He quoted some of their own poets. For in him we live and move and have our being, he said, even as one of your own poets has said, God is among us. He was quoting poets from Cilicia and Eratus who came from Crete. Paul was making a strong point, and now he moves to his conclusion. Therefore repent, he says, and turn back to God. For God has appointed one man, Jesus, and has proved it by raising him from the dead. And immediately he mentioned Jesus and the resurrection. There was uproar, because they did not believe in the resurrection from the dead. Now, at the uproar, there were those who disbelieved, some who disputed, but there were some who believed, including one of the council members himself, Dionysius the Areopagite, and then Damaris, one of the women who were in the area. Well, the irony is twofold. Firstly, of all the names of the great philosophers who were there that day, all are forgotten except the two who believed in Jesus, Dionysius and Damaris. And the second irony? Those philosophers who had disputed with Paul down in the royal stoa were up here refusing to accept the bread of life and instead were content with the scraps of human wisdom. <laughs> This is not exactly a monastery, but it's the heart of downtown Athens. And what is happening here today is just something in the normal life of Athens. There's a strike on about taxi drivers. They want better conditions. Now, the Apostle Paul is not likely to have been in a monastery somewhere in this situation. He's in the streets talking with the people. And that's where Christianity should be, in the streets with the people about the concerns they have on everyday life. Christian faith isn't an escape from living, it's thrusting your faith into living and being real with the issues of today. <laughs> Oh, my God.
For thousands of years, this narrow strip of land has been the only way nations and tribes could travel north or south, or south to north, here in Israel. It's a strip of land between the Dead Sea and the Judean mountains. And standing like a huge sentinel, guarding the pass, is Masada, a diamond-shaped rock with sheer cliffs a thousand feet on either side. Over this pass, it stands looking, guarding, protecting. And for thousands of years, it's been a symbol of a people's struggle for nationhood. Masada was first fortified by the Maccabean king, Alexander, in the first century BC. Little remains of his period. It was King Herod the Great who built the strong fortifications, the remains of which we see today. In 40 BC, Herod was an influential young Jewish nobleman who became involved in a civil war between two factions. One favoured Rome, the other Parthenia. As a supporter of Rome, Herod fled with his family to Masada. Herod left his family here and went on to Rome, where he was appointed by the Roman Senate, King of Judea. In 37 BC, Herod returned to claim his crown. But Herod still lived in fear of revolt, and so was driven to build a royal sanctuary and fortress on Masada's summit. In 66 AD, the Jews rebelled against Titus. Many of them fled to various parts of the country when Titus responded with an enormous show of force. There was massacres right throughout the land. It is estimated that more than a million Jews died 
in the reprisals brought by Titus at this time. Jerusalem was sacked just as Jesus had said it would be in 70 AD. Not one stone was left upon the other. Some of the Jews fled down here, south to Masada. Just a few years earlier, some of the zealots had captured the Roman outposts over here and they were keeping Herod's old palace and fort now as their last stand. Herod had built this not only as a fort but as a palace and therefore had it well stocked with provisions. There are large provision rooms for wine vats, for nuts, for fruit, for olives, for grapes, for dried fruits, for flour. In fact, the ingenious water systems that were built into the rocks and the large storerooms of food meant that they could withstand a very long siege. This was the site of one of the bloodiest and the proudest moment of Israel's history. We're right on the top of Masada by the Dead Sea. Now the last handful of Jewish zealots had retreated to the southernmost point of the land and had holed up here in the well-stocked and well-defended fort. Titus marched 10,000 Roman troops down and surrounded this mountain and for three years fought against them. But there was no way that he could win. So he decided to build an enormous ramp up the wall, more than a thousand feet in height. What happened next was a classic example of siege warfare. Titus ordered Flavius Silva to take charge of the final assault upon Masada. He brought tens of thousands of Jewish slaves to build this huge urban ramp, 1,300 feet high, up the side of the walls of Masada. The Romans were good engineers. They were well stocked, they had plenty of provisions, and they had 10,000 crack troops and thousands of slaves. They mounted a campaign, but they were against zealots who were religious in their fervor devoted to God and their own survival. The Romans ran this five kilometer wall the whole way around so that no one could get out and built eight large siege camps to house their soldiers and others for the slaves. And then they built the ramp and slowly began to drag the huge war machines. It looked like Masada would fall. <laughs> Zealots on top of Masada had withstood three years of siege by the Romans. But their leader, Eliezer ben Yar, knew that they would not be able to withstand this attack by the Romans. The Romans, with their war machines and stone catapults, were going to win. <laughs> 
great siege machine was dragged to the top. Thousands of people were employed, and the battering ram smashed against the wall, and the walls began to crumble. Eliezer put up wooden defences, and the Romans fired hundreds of flaming arrows, and the wooden defences caught fire and burnt through. By the end of that night, the last of the wooden walls would have been all burnt through. That evening, Eliezer gathered more than 960 people that were here in the compound together. I have a copy of what he said, as recorded by Josephus. Let Eliezer Benyar speak for himself. Speaking to his people, he said, Since we, long ago, my friends, resolved never to be servants of the Romans, nor of any other but God himself, who alone is true and the Lord of mankind, and the time is now when we will have to put our resolution into practice. I cannot but esteem it as a favour that God has granted us, still within our power to die bravely and in a state of freedom, rather than to live in slavery. And he finished by saying, the punishments which we will receive in this life, let us receive not from the Romans, but from our own hands. Let our wives die before they're abused. Let our children die before they are tasted of slavery. And after we have slayed them, let us bestow upon ourselves death, that we might die in a glorious funeral. Let us first of all destroy our money, but let us not destroy our provisions, lest when they've broken in and seize us, they will see that we spared for nothing. And with one word he finished up, according to our original resolution, let us prefer death before slavery. They elected 10 men, each to kill about 100 others. And slowly the women and the children were put to death. And then the 10 men wrote their names on lots and drew their names. And one killed each of the other nine in turn. And the next morning, the fires of the walls burnt down. And with great pride, Silver's troops burst through. And they found nothing but 960 bodies. And in the hand of one man, the lots with their names upon it, that they had chosen to die. Today, Masada stands as a symbol of Jewish pride in their history and in their nationhood. Even in the day of Paul, before Masada fell, they were fiercely proud of their nation and of their history. And wherever Paul went, he went first of all to his own people and spoke to them in the synagogues. And wherever he wrote letters, such as when he wrote to the church at Philippi in Greece, he explained to them the traditions of his people and of his heritage. For example, when he wrote to those Greeks, he said, I was circumcised on the eighth day. I belong to the nation of Israel. I am a Hebrew of the Hebrews. As to the law, I was a Pharisee. As to zeal, I was a persecutor. As to righteousness, I was blameless. Paul, like all Jews, was proud to be a patriot. 
Jewish people have always loved their history and have been proud of their traditions. And here in the scroll room, people come to meditate on the law and to pray and to consider the Torah, the law of God. Saul had learnt the Torah by heart, even as the same way young men today still learn by heart the Torah, the sacred scriptures. שנוהג כמו רבנן, שתפילת המנחה מתפללים עד השקיעה, אז תפילת ערבית הוא לא יכול להתפלל רק? החמי, לגבי תפילת המנחה, כאן, כאן, לגבי תפילת המנחה, מה יהיה הדין? נמשיך את הגמרא, אמר, השתיק ולאמר לב אל עמידי. מי שתק? רבי יצחק. רבי יצחק, הוא לא ידע לענות על השאלה הזאת. In his preaching, Paul frequently went over the history of his own people, recited the purposes and the prophecies of his people. Paul was proud to be a Jew and proud of his history and traditions. That is why he always went to the Jewish synagogue first and spoke to his own people every time. It was only when he was rejected that he then went to the Gentiles and told them of the gospel about Jesus. There are two things about the heritage of Paul that we ought to consider. Firstly, Paul loved his own people. He loved his Jewish race dearly. In fact, he even said, I wish that I were accursed of God if this would be the means by which my own people were to be saved. He had a mission to take the gospel of Jesus as Messiah to his own people. Secondly, Saul was proud of his Jewish traditions, proud of the law, the Torah of God, proud of his heritage. One of the problems that troubled Paul about his own people more than anything else was, why did they reject Jesus? Why did the Jews who were expecting the coming of the Messiah reject him when he came? Paul knew the stories that Jesus told and many of the Jews of his own day remembered them well, such as the vineyard owner who sent some servants to find out how the laborers were getting on in the vineyard. But the laborers killed the servants, so he sent another servant, and they killed him. Then the vineyard owner said, well, I'll send my son. And they even cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. Even so, the Jews rejected Jesus as Messiah. But why should they? There were more than 300 references in the Old Testament to the coming of Jesus, and more than 60 of them could apply only to Jesus. Paul wrestled with this problem, and in his letter to the Christians at Rome, made three suggestions. And the first one is that God is sovereign. God, out of his mercy and wisdom, decided to allow the Jews to have the right to choose whether to reject Jesus or not. He says it's somewhat like a potter who takes some clay in his hands and works it and molds it up into the shape of a nice urn. Now, that clay has no right to say to the potter, why are you making me like this? In other words, we have no right to question why it is that God chooses one and not the other. Abraham has no right to question God about why Isaac should be chosen and Ishmael rejected. God, in his wisdom, says Paul, gave Jews the freedom to choose. And they made a choice to reject Jesus as Messiah. They preferred to have the law rather than liberty. They preferred to have the rules rather than a relationship. Then Paul goes on to make a third point. But even so, in spite of the fact that Jesus was rejected as Messiah, the Jews are still God's own people. They are still his chosen people. They still have a purpose in the whole economy of God. To sum it up, Paul brings what we call the allegory of the olive. I can understand why, when he wrote to the Roman Christians, he used this allegory because there was a well-known Jewish synagogue in Rome called the Synagogue of the Olive, and that would be customary for them to think about the olive. He said it was like this. The grand old olive tree was a symbol of the kingdom of God. Its roots went way down into the Old Testament, and branches grew up fruitfully, and that was Israel at its best dead branches were to be cut off and then wild branches, Gentiles, were to be grafted in. This was a practice in Roman viniculture. 
the wild branches brought new vitality into the growth. But miracle, the old branches that had been cast off would one day be brought back into the old stock. And the new branch and the old branch together will be part of God's kingdom. Paul is saying that in God's kingdom, both the Jew and the Gentile have an important place, that both of them belong in the future of his kingdom. We started off in Masada, where Titus had conquered the Jews in 73 AD. The entire nation was virtually wiped out and thousands of Jews and Jewish Christians were carried here to Rome to work as slaves. This arch of Titus represents his victory. They're inscribed here, the victories over the Jewish people, the great triumph of procession, carrying on their shoulders their menorah from the temple and the great covenant box. Titus was a raider of the ark. Did being carried off into captivity once more mean the end of the Jewish race? Paul, more than anything else, was a patriot. He wanted his people to be saved, to be part of God's eternal kingdom. He wanted his people to come into the kingdom of God in the Messianic era. More than anything else, the Apostle Paul loved his people. He was a patriot for his Jews. Mm -hmm. 
After the long and exhausting third missionary journey, Paul came here to Caesarea on the coast. And when he got here, he discovered that friends were here not wanting him to go on to Jerusalem. That in a dream he was troubled, indicating he would get into trouble if he went to Jerusalem. There were some rumours and gossip around that some men were threatening to kill him if he did go to Jerusalem. And then there was a prophecy that said that if he went to Jerusalem, he would be taken prisoner. But at least he would then go on to Rome, where he could still witness. So Paul determined to go ahead as a proclaimer. He proclaimed that gospel both in his written epistles and in his spoken word. Fort Antonius was a very important fort in the first century here in Jerusalem. Like this citadel of David, it was part of the original old walls surrounding Jerusalem. And it was here the Roman commander kept about a thousand of his troops to keep peace in what was rather a troublesome jurisdiction. A very interesting event took place here concerning the Apostle Paul. Paul came into Jerusalem in spite of being warned not to, that there were death threats on his life. In this episode, we look at Paul as a proclaimer of the gospel. You would never think that here, in a fort, under threat of death, that you would see Paul proclaiming the gospel. Paul was warned in Caesarea not to come here to Jerusalem. They said there were already people plotting his death. The rumours in Jerusalem were that Paul was one of those people who was neglecting the law. He was neglecting circumcision. 
and he was breaking down the traditions of the faith. Some Judaizers had recently arrived from Turkey. And they were determined to stop Paul once and for all. They accused him of many wrong things, and they stirred up the crowd to really fever pitch. The real problem was there had to be something upon which Paul could be accused of doing that was wrong. To the Jews, their temple was the most sacred site of all, and so was its precincts. Archaeologists have found two marble plaques which says that any Gentile going past this area is liable for death. And that was going to be the point they caught Paul on. They've been trying to trap Paul on his refusal to obey the law and the ceremonies of the Jews. But now someone said they'd seen old Tremephus come into the court area. Now he was an Ephesian and as such a Gentile was a breaking the law. And the crowd rose with anger, rushed to the house and grabbed Paul, dragged him out, and before you knew where you were, a full-scale riot had broken out in the temple area. News of the riot quickly got to the commander at the fort and he raced down with about 120 men to the temple area and they forced their way inside the crowd and they grabbed Paul and stopped the people beating him and then they began to pull him aside to the fort Antonia and then they had to take him up the stairs and the most incredible thing happened the stairs were so crowded the people were jostling and fighting that they even took Paul bodily and passed him over the heads of the soldiers to the top of the stairs. As he was being dragged up the stairs, Paul asked the commander in perfect Greek if he had permission to speak. Oh, you understand Greek, he said. That was the first of many surprises that he was going to have. Paul said, I'm a Jew, a citizen of Tarsus, which is no mean city. And Commander Claudius Lysias, for that was his name, gave permission to the apostle to speak to the roaring crowd. And Paul did something of great interest. He turned to the crowd and addressed them in perfect Hebrew. And when they heard the cultured tones of the sacred language, they fell quiet. Claudius Lysias was surprised when he heard Paul speak cultured Greek. Then he was surprised when he heard that he spoke Hebrew and quietened down the crowd. He was going to be even more surprised when he hears that Paul is a Roman citizen and he, Claudius Lysias, had handcuffed him and chained him and put him into prison in a way no Roman citizen ought to be treated. The crowd had quietened and now Paul gave, I believe, one of the greatest sermons that he ever given in his life. I believe that this presentation by Paul in that situation in Fort Antonius was outstanding. He recounted his life. He told of his training as a Pharisee, of his zealousness for the law, of his conversion, of his witness to Jews and to Gentiles. And when he mentioned Gentiles, the crowd broke into uproar again. And Claudius Lysias had to rescue Paul and take him down into the fort. Paul preached on a number of occasions. And we have five full speeches recorded and six other brief addresses. But I don't think we've got a finer example of Paul the Proclaimer than that day, in the midst of a riot, he proclaimed the gospel at Fort Antonius. The next morning, Paul was taken before the council and questioned about the riot the previous day. He was questioned by the Pharisees and the Sadducees, but they started fighting among themselves when Paul raised the issue of the resurrection. Next day, 40 of the Jews plotted to kill him. Words of this plot reached the tribune, 
and for his own safety, Paul was escorted by an armed guard to prison in Caesarea. When Paul proclaimed the gospel, he used more than the spoken word. He also used the written word. Paul wrote three kinds of letters. The first he wrote to churches he established. In these he argued about the faith and laid down doctrine. The letters to the Corinthians and the Ephesians are typical of this first sort. The second were the pastoral letters written to encourage young ministers like Timothy and Titus. The third were those he wrote in prison. The Apostle Paul used his imprisonment constructively. I'm always amazed how he was able to use the limitations of his confinement to help other people who were in freedom. Paul was a great psychologist, and he used his imprisonment through his letters and contacts with people to really build up the self-esteem and status of the young Christians. When I started to study the letters that he wrote from prison, I found out that the Apostle Paul mentioned more than 40 people by name. Erastus, Epaphras, Epaphroditus, Silas, Timothy, over and over the names come out. And in every case, he builds them up in their sense of self-worth and self-esteem. Paul has a special little Greek construction that he uses, which means a fellow, fellow soldier, fellow worker, fellow laborer, fellow prisoner, fellow minister. In other words, they were with him in the work that they were doing, even though he was confined here in prison. When you study the letters of Paul, you discover that they are informed, they are inspired, and they are instructive. But there's a very interesting problem that's been raised by some scholars. Did Paul write all of these letters that the New Testament ascribes to his name? Or did someone else write them? In fact, questions have been raised about the, what we call, prison epistles and the pastoral epistles to Timothy and to Titus. And some have raised the questions about 1 Thessalonians. Well, in our day, we've been able to examine the manuscripts much more closely. And by using computer technology, we've been able to go into the Greek construction, the use of conjunctions and vowels and the way the sentences are constructed and vocabulary and style. And by making comparison of all the letters, we're able to say with some certainty that they were all written by the same person and that there is no reason why all of these letters shouldn't have been written by Paul and in point of fact, they probably were written by Paul. There are three things that come out of all of his letters, especially those written in prison. First of all, Paul always proclaims the gospel of truth about Jesus Christ. Secondly, he doesn't allow himself ever to get sidetracked on irrelevant issues. And thirdly, he makes the point that Jesus Christ can change the lives of people. To use our technology, for him, Jesus was the great change agent. It was only through Jesus Christ that people could find newness and purpose in life. And that was the central point of all of his letters. As a proclaimer, Paul was responsible for challenging three basic cultural customs. One had to do with racism, the other was the status of women, and the third was slavery.
slaves in this house very rarely ever saw this room. This was the master's room. Institutionalized slavery has always been a curse, and the Apostle Paul did more than anyone to outlaw slavery. It came about because two people, one a master and one a slave, both became Christian. Paul wrote to the master. His name was Philemon, and the little letter from Paul to Philemon is in your New Testament. And Paul converted his slave, Onesimus, or useless, as he was known. He said that now you are both brothers. Your functions are different, but your status is the same. You are both sons of God. And in saying so, Paul helped undermine the whole institution of slavery. The scourge of racism is gradually being outlawed around the world and thanks must go to the Apostle Paul. We must understand Paul in his cultural setting and in his day racism was an institution. The Jews thought they were better than anyone else, the Greeks thought everybody else was barbarians, the Romans had no time for anyone else. And then came Paul saying, there is no difference at all for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. He said, God unites people of different races into one body in Christ. And with that teaching, he began to outlaw racist attitudes forever. <laughs> The third cultural custom that Paul ran into was the status of women. Paul came up against the same problem that still exists in many parts of the world today. For Paul, there was no distinction. There is no difference between Jews and Gentiles, slaves and free, men and women, he said. You are all one in union with Christ Jesus. Paul was called on to arbitrate in a dispute in the church at Corinth over the role of women. Although Paul had a basic principle, it seems to have been overruled in a number of instances. The first problem concerned women speaking in church. He told them to ask their husbands when they returned home. What if they had no husband? He didn't answer that question. The other problem at Corinth was, what should women wear on their heads when they prayed or spoke in church? Paul gives us five answers as to why women should have their heads covered while preaching or praying, but in the end, he tells the church to judge for yourselves. A deeper issue concerned Paul completely changing the customs by appointing women as leaders in the churches. At Philippi, there was Lydia, Euodia, and Syntyche. In Thessalonica, there were a number of women of high standing. In Athens, there was Damaris, and Priscilla developed churches in her house at Corinth, Rome, and Ephesus. In Rome, there was Phoebe, whom Paul calls a minister in exactly the same way as he calls Timothy and Titus ministers. There was also Junia and her husband Andronicus, both of whom were apostles. In fact, of 26 people mentioned in the church at Rome, eight of them are definitely women. In his letters, Paul mentions more than 20 women in leadership positions. Paul had changed forever the status of women. of his prison in Caesarea on the coast were the very last walls that Paul was to see in all of Palestine. He then shipped out of this port towards Rome after two years of imprisonment. He was here in prison because he preached the gospel. This is a good place to assess his effectiveness as a proclaimer. There have been some theologians in the last century who have 
claimed that Paul was the greatest corrupter of the Christian message, that he took the simple message of Jesus, the carpenter of Nazareth, and complicated it with tremendous theological insights. But a closer examination of the teachings of the Apostle Paul revealed that he understood clearly with great insight the details of the teaching of Jesus and that he applied it in a most remarkable way to a very sophisticated and complex world. Far from being the greatest corrupter of the Christian faith, Paul was in point of fact the greatest interpreter of the Christian message from the greatest teacher of all. Paul was indeed the greatest proclaimer of all time. He single-handedly, more than anybody else, did more to extend the Christian gospel into all the known world. But more than that, he gave us strategies that are still workable today and methods that are still applicable. For 30 years I've considered the proclamations of Paul and the more I've looked at them, the more I've seen how applicable and how workable they are in our situation. Shortly after his death, the early church began to gather together his speeches, the various records of them, the travel diaries of Luke and the letters that he wrote. They began to put them together and they kept them and they circulated them and copied them and they treated them just as they did the Old Testament scriptures. The early church was saying something to us about they, the way they valued the words of Paul. More than anything else, it was the way the early church treated those writings of Paul that convinces me of the enormous value of his words. More than half the total New Testament was written around what he had to say and the copies of the letters that he wrote. They indicated in the most beautiful way, once and for all, what the early church thought and what we in our turn ought to think of Paul the Proclaimer.
when the Apostle Paul came here to the temple area and began to proclaim that Jesus Christ was the Messiah, he had great success. Like the early disciples, many people believed, believed in Jesus on the basis of the Old Testament prophecies. They quoted from Abraham, from Samuel, from Joel, and from the other prophets to prove that Jesus was Messiah. And many of these Jewish people, as they believed, became fulfilled Jews, knowing the Messiah personally as Lord and Savior. Like modern-day folk singers, the Old Testament prophets also saw Jerusalem as a beautiful city. Today, 2,000 years after the temple was destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD, there is still a timeless beauty about these walls. These rebuilt walls once supported the mound on which Herod's temple was built. The huge stones at the bottom weigh over 20 tons and were found in their original position after having been covered by earth for 1900 years. The children of Israel's first temple was the tabernacle or portable sanctuary they carried with them in the desert. It wasn't until David had conquered this city of Jerusalem that he realized the need for a permanent place for God to dwell. However, it was his son Solomon who built the first temple here in 960 BC. Nothing remains today of that first temple. Over the following centuries, Solomon's temple was neglected until 300 years later it was in need of considerable repair. In 587 BC, the repaired temple was looted by Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. When the exiles returned, Ezekiel had a vision of a new temple which lasted 500 years until the Roman general Pompey captured this part of the world in 63 BC. Herod built his temple in an attempt to win the favor of the Jews. He took great care to respect the sacred area, training a thousand priests as stonemasons so they could build the shrine. The lowest foundations of Herod's wall can be seen in this excavation. To build his temple, Herod first of all leveled off an area measuring 400 meters by 250 meters, the area roughly now occupied by the Muslim Dome of the Rock Mosque. In some places, the rock was cut away, but a large part was built up with rubble and the whole area enclosed by a wall of huge stone blocks. Herod's temple, finally finished in 64 AD, lasted only six years before the Roman general Titus gave the order to raise it and all of Jerusalem to the ground. And that's the way it stayed, right up to the present. But what has the destruction of the temple got to do with Paul as a prophet? All of scripture, including the writings of Paul, have a prophetic ministry. The destruction of the temple in 70 AD had been foretold by Jesus on his entry into the city just prior to his arrest and crucifixion. Just as that prophecy came to pass, as we can see just by looking around, so the prophecies made by Paul will also come to pass. <laughs> 
The ancient city of Corinth in Greece played an important part in the Roman Empire. Its location on the western end of the isthmus between Greece and the Peloponnesus meant that it was controlling all of the trade across that narrow piece of land and all the trade that went north into Greece. There were in fact two ports, one on each side and connected to the city by long walls. Paul came here during his second missionary journey and stayed 18 months. Corinth was a center of immorality. Above the city on the Acro-Corinth was a temple dedicated to Aphrodite and Paul agonized over some of the church members who were still involved in the pagan worship of this idol. In his letters to the church here at Corinth, known as 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Paul sets out for us the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. When Paul gave his teaching on the Lord's Supper, he very strongly tied it in to the second coming of Jesus. As a prophet of God, Paul had to warn the people about how they should behave. And what better place than here at Corinth? He made a number of points. First of all, there should be no idolatry because we no longer believe in idols. Secondly, there should be no immorality because how can a man, he says, join his body to that of a prostitute? For do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit and you are not your own but you have been bought with a price and that there should be no drunkenness and irreverent behavior particularly as people would meet together in the Lord's Supper and misbehave. It was because the immorality and misbehavior of the community was coming into the life of the church that it began to affect even the communion the most sacred meeting of Christians. So Paul thought it necessary to say to them, for I've delivered to you what I received from the Lord, that on the night in which the Lord was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body which is given for you. And in the same way, after supper also, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Drink of it, all of you, in remembrance of me. And Paul added, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he come. You see, the first recorded instance we have of what happened in the upper room on the night in which Jesus was betrayed came about because the Apostle Paul, as a prophet, had to warn the people here in Corinth how they ought to behave. Since Paul first wrote about the events of the Last Supper, the manner in which the sacrament is celebrated has gone through many changes. Despite these changes, Paul would want us to be sure that we partake in such a way that we do not bring judgment upon ourselves because of our carelessness. For Paul, the Lord's Supper is a prophetic pointing to our new life and presence with Christ. In Paul's words, we are to partake until he comes. This is St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, and every day there are services held in many parts of this magnificent building. Dedicated to Peter, one of the early apostles, we'll take a closer look at his life and the way the church remembers him here in Rome in our series, Discovering the Young Church. <laughs> 
a prophet, Paul also talked about baptism. He reminded his readers that baptism was like being resurrected spiritually. Going through the waters of baptism was like being spiritually cleansed. Baptism is a spiritual symbol of what is going to happen at the second coming of our Lord. The key to our understanding of baptism lies in our identification with the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus. Now while the customs and styles of baptism have changed over the centuries, the New Testament form of baptism of believers by immersion symbolizes our old life being buried beneath the water and being raised to new life. Paul would not equate baptism as a new form of circumcision to initiate babies into the kingdom. Neither would he declare that Christians can be saved from immorality, sin and moral imperfection by baptism. That requires a conscious decision to accept Christ's offer of salvation through his death and resurrection. Paul was the first of the apostles to make the link between the sacraments and the second coming of the Lord Jesus. He said that baptism and the Lord's Supper are not just rituals of the church for initiation and remembrance, but are in themselves prophetic, pointing to our new life and presence with the Lord. As Paul considered the destiny of the people of God, three questions occupied his mind. The first is, what was the nature of the Christian hope? The people at Thessalonica lived in a despairing world. Would God change all of this? Yes, he replied. Christians could look to a new heaven and a new earth. The second question concerned this age to come. How would other believers who had already died in faith be affected? Paul reassured them. They would be the very first to see Christ and to rise with him.
From Greece, we've travelled to Rome and the catacombs, just outside of Rome, along the Via Appia. This ancient road leads from the port of Rome into the city itself. The Apostle Paul was to come along this road when he arrived in Rome as a prisoner from Jerusalem. There was already an established Christian community in this part of the world when the Apostle Paul came here in AD 61, and the community came out in force to meet him. There were slaves, there were a few rich people, there were some merchants, people who belonged to the entertainment industry in, in the army, and they gathered to welcome the Apostle as he arrived. Right here in Rome, along the Via Appia, many Christians gathered in house groups, and by the third century, some wealthy people had established large house churches in their homes. And they were, in point of fact, parishes. The catacombs, or cemeteries, were not originally designed to save people from persecution. They were really a practical alternative to burying people on the surface of the land. You see, land here was very expensive. And the soft ground underneath, or tufa, could be easily hollowed out into long passages and multi-level chambers for the burial of the dead. There are hundreds of kilometres of these catacombs underneath Rome. These niches were carved into the walls and people placed the bodies of their loved ones there. Sometimes there was one body, sometimes two or more. Very wealthy families had their own tombs. Across the front of each of the niche would be a large marble plaque and on them would be carved the name of the person who was buried there, very much the same way as we do with a tombstone today. One of the reasons why these catacombs became so popular was the cult of the martyr. It was believed that the closer you were buried to the martyr, the sooner you'd be resurrected at the time of the resurrection. By the end of the fifth century, the practice of burying people here in the catacombs had ceased. However, by then, large numbers of people were coming to visit the catacombs as pilgrims to venerate those who had died here. But by the end of the fifth century, the bones of the martyrs were being taken from the catacombs back to churches, and they, in their turn, became the centre of adoration. In this part of the catacombs is a chapel and around me are five popes buried. Five popes martyred in the early part of the Christian church. This is a good place to ask the third of the questions that Paul would make a strong emphasis upon in speaking about the coming of Jesus Christ. As a prophet, he looked forward to the coming of Jesus Christ and he foretold what would happen to us. You see, when you think of a catacomb like this and all the dead bodies around and people coming here to look for loved ones and relatives and to be close to martyrs, the question naturally would be raised, how shall the dead be raised? With what bodies shall they have? And Paul answered their questions by saying, how are the dead raised? Well, this mortal body shall put on an immortal and this ugly body shall become beautiful and this physical shall become spiritual. What I mean to say is, he said, and he used the example of a seed dropped into the ground which would grow up into a beautiful flower. What I mean to say is that this mortal shall put on immortal and this perishable become 
imperishable. Then shall come to pass the truth. Death is swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is thy victory? Where, O grave, is thy sting? Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul summed it up by saying that we shall not all sleep, but the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. When Christ comes, we will have a new body, not made with hands, but eternal in the heavens. We will be raised with Christ, and our body, like his resurrected body, shall be a new and a perfected body. Well, we've looked at Paul as a prophet. He had three functions. Like the prophets of old, he was a fourth teller, warning people of the judgment that was to come and of repentance and of the need to be right with God. Secondly, he was a healer who cared for people in their body and in their soul. And thirdly, he was a foreteller who told of what was to happen in the future when Christ shall come. There will be a new heaven, a new earth, a new age, and we will be changed from glory into glory till in heaven we take our place, casting down our crowns before thee, lost in wonder, love, and praise. The Apostle Paul went into some of the finest prisons in the whole of the Roman Empire. He was imprisoned on many occasions. In fact, it seems almost like a prerequisite to be a good apostle. You had to also be a long-term prisoner. The Apostle Paul suffered greatly as a prisoner. On one occasion, he said, I have been near to death many times. Three times I have been lashed by the Romans almost to death. Five times I have suffered the 39 lashes from the Jews. I've been stoned with rocks almost to the point of death. I've been shipwrecked afloat on the wild seas for more than 24 hours at a stretch. I've been in dangers in my travels. I've been in dangers in the cities, in the wilds, among false friends, among false Jews. I've spent my life in danger. Dangers in the city dangers on the high seas, dangers from false friends, from other believers. He said, I've gone without food, without clothing, without sleep or rest. That's what it cost to be an apostle. In this episode, we're going to consider Paul as a prisoner. Now, he was in many of the great and famous prisons of the Roman world. In fact, on some occasions, he was in the same prison on more than one occasion. He was imprisoned in Jerusalem several times, in Philippi, in Ephesus, at Caesarea, and of course, some very long imprisonments at Rome itself. How did Paul cope as a prisoner? I mean, the situations were deplorable and the circumstances terrible. Did he develop some sense of philosophy of coping in difficulties? He did. And he made several points. And the first one of Paul's, what you might call, philosophy of coping in under difficulties was the fact that he believed that God could supply our every need. He used that phrase on several occasions. My God is able to supply your every need. No matter what your deficiency is, God is able to supply your needs. When in prison, he wrote the letter to the Corinthian church. He made an interesting point to those people at Corinth. He said, not many of you are wealthy. Not many of you are noble or of high birth. And not many of you have means 
to care for you, but God is able to supply your every need. No matter what deficiency you face in life, God is able to supply your every need. That's the first point that Paul as a prisoner mentions, which is really helpful to us today, that no matter what our circumstances are, he is able to supply our every need. Paul's imprisonments meant that he could not personally visit the churches he had established, and so he did the next best thing. He wrote them letters. These letters, as we've already said, make up the bulk of our New Testament. In this sense, we can be thankful for the times of imprisonment faced by Paul, because it was only enforced imprisonment that caused him to write instead of visiting, to dictate his thoughts instead of lecturing and speaking. Imprisonment wasn't used as a punishment as such in Paul's day. Prisoners were accused persons awaiting judgment. Punishment in the first century was either by crucifixion for the worst offenders or by beheading, impaling and stoning for capital offences. Other punishments were being condemned to the mines for life or by scourging with a whip or by exile like the sentence given to the Apostle John. When Paul came back to Jerusalem, he was well aware of the sentence that awaited him. Paul knew he was walking into trouble, but still he came to Jerusalem, walking up this same old road that exists here today. And yet he knew that God was able to sustain him and God was able to enable him to stand firm no matter what troubles that he might face. Paul was coming into the greatest test that he would ever face in his life. He'd already been threatened with death. He'd been warned from Caesarea not to come to Jerusalem, but still he was willing to come. He was facing the death threats, which were very real while he was here in Jerusalem. As you know, he got caught up in a riot near the temple. There was an outburst of public rage against him. He was arrested. He was taken up and placed in prison in Fort Antonius. And then he was brought for trial before the Sanhedrin. It was the same Sanhedrin of which he was earlier a member himself. That night, he was given a message of encouragement. He was told by God, take courage. Do not be afraid. You'll be a witness to me here in Jerusalem and also in Rome. The atmosphere became more oppressive and dark. And Paul himself realized that the end must surely be coming near. Then he had a message late at night that there was a plot to kill him, that four men had taken a vow that they would not eat or drink anything at all until they had murdered him. They were joined with another group of men who took the same vow. They were determined to wipe that man out. And so it was that Paul that night, when the plot was discovered, was taken out secretly and guarded by a group of Roman soldiers, was taken to Caesarea to keep him safe. Thank you. 
Caesarea was built on the coast of Palestine on the Mediterranean Sea to give the Romans access to the Middle East. They built an artificial harbour by taking huge blocks of stone, some 50 foot in length, 10 feet square, and dropping them into 180 feet of water to build a huge harbour. And there, this centre became the centre for administration, for Roman justice, and also when the winds blew, a cool relief from the heat of the inner desert sands. Paul was brought here to Caesarea following the riot in Jerusalem. He was brought here originally for safekeeping, but he was imprisoned here in the Roman garrison for the next two years of his life. The governor here at Caesarea at the time was Felix. He was a lusty, power-hungry man. R the Roman historian Tacitus says that he exercised the powers of a king with the mind of a slave. He played with Paul for two years, hoping that Paul would give him a bribe to be released. But when Paul wouldn't give him the bribe, he just kept him in prison. At the end of the two years, it wasn't that Paul was released. Rather, it was that he was recalled to Rome to start the rest of his otherwise undistinguishable career. Governor Felix was succeeded by Governor Festus. Now, Festus was probably a more open-minded man than Felix was. Certainly, he gave Paul a better deal. He tried him and found him innocent. But still, he kept him in prison because he was trying to win favour from the Jews. He did offer Paul a retrial back in Jerusalem if Paul wanted it, but Paul knew that that would be just a kangaroo court. He would get no justice there. So Paul uttered the famous phrase that was available to every Roman citizen, I appeal to Caesar. Nero was the Caesar at the time, and Paul could go to Rome for trial. Looking at him, Festus said simply, You have appealed to Caesar? To Caesar you shall go. It so happened that King Agrippa and his wife Bernice were visiting Festus at the time here at Caesarea. And so Paul was paraded before them. Now Agrippa had no authority to release Paul, but he was able to interpret some of the Jewish traditions and understanding. Every time Paul spoke to Felix, to Festus, before Agrippa, he presented his gospel clearly, a witness. This was the proclamation of a prisoner. While he was in prison, Paul wrote letters to a number of churches, some of which we now have. It was his friend who was here, Dr. Luke, who wrote the gospel that bears his name, Luke's gospel, while Paul was also here in prison. And it was while he was in prison that Christians from Jerusalem and from other areas around Caesarea came here and visited Paul, and in those two years, he encouraged them and strengthened them and helped the church grow. Paul once wrote in the letter to the church at Corinth that we live under many trials and difficulties, but God always strengthens us in our trials and difficulties. And the thing that encourages me from his imprisonment here at Caesarea was just this, that there's nothing that comes upon us that is too great for the inner strength that God gives us. He never allows us to be tested beyond our strength to endure. Paul had a right as a Roman citizen for a trial before the highest tribunal in the empire in Rome. He appealed to Caesar and that was where his trial would be heard. However, Governor Festus had certain responsibilities as well. He had to file a proper charge sheet, he had to send copies of the evidence that had already been given, and probably he included King Herod Agrippa's comments about the Jewish traditions and backgrounds. But Paul wanted to go to Rome not just to be found innocent. Paul had an unwritten agenda. He wanted to go to Rome, as he said on two occasions, to strengthen the Christians there, to help build up the church in the faith, and then to go by Rome through to Spain. Because more than anything else, he wanted to preach the gospel on the rim of the empire. 
This is the Via Appia, the old Appian Way. It leads from the ancient port city of Appia Forum to Rome, a distance of nearly 40 kilometers. Because this was the main road in and out of Rome, it was lined with the tombs of important people. Paul's voyage to Rome from Caesarea wasn't a quick one. As we've already seen in a previous episode, he was shipwrecked on Malta and spent three months on the island, waiting for calm seas. So Paul walked the 40 kilometers up the Via Appia. After he had traveled about 35 kilometers, he came to the Forum of the Appia, and there he met at a place called the Three Taverns, a group of Christians who had walked out of Rome to meet with him. How did the church come to be established in Rome in the first place? Uh, there is nothing in the writings of Paul or of Luke or the rest of the New Testament that indicates how the early church began in Rome, except for the fact that there were some Christians from Rome on the day of Pentecost. They went back to Rome and presumably established the church here. Later on, both Paul and Peter were to strengthen the believers in the heart of Rome. The first Romans that Paul had anything to do with were Priscilla and Aquila, who were evicted from Rome in the year 47 AD under the Emperor Claudius. Paul wanted very much to come to Rome. It was the center of the empire, and he wished to be able to take the message from Rome right through to Spain. He came here to Rome under the leadership of the Emperor Nero. Nero came from a very famous and great family. His mother was the wife of the Emperor Claudius, and she wanted her son to become Emperor, so she murdered her husband, the Emperor Claudius. When Nero became Emperor, in a fit of temper one day, he in turn murdered his mother. This was the man to whom Paul had decided to appeal for justice when he said, I appeal to Caesar. Paul could have been depressed when he came here to Rome. There'd been many times in his life when he felt really down. In fact, while he was here in prison in Rome, he wrote that he was cold, he was without friends, he didn't have a coat, he needed some books. But the Lord stood by him and strengthened him. Once he had written to the Corinthians that when he came into Macedonia, he was very depressed, that he was alone and under a great deal of tension and pressure. But the Lord was with him and strengthened him. And throughout his trials, Paul knew what it was to have the strength of the Lord present with him. Paul apparently was released after the first trial. He was alone during that trial, and he wrote that no one stood with him and strengthened him. But upon his release, he had about two years in which he was under a sort of a loose house arrest. However, he traveled to Crete and possibly to Macedonia, and then came the disastrous fire of Nero. He was rearrested, imprisoned, and sentenced to death. The Colosseum wasn't built when Paul arrived here in Rome. It was started in 70 AD and put into regular use 10 years later. It seated 50,000 people and was the site of the greatest gladiatorial battles ever seen. There were battles between professional fighters and between slaves. The Romans had the capacity to flood the central area and hold mock naval battles, which were fought to the bitter end. They would also construct a forest, complete with trees and wild animals, and then watch as men would hunt them. It was here that the first Christians were martyred, when Nero outlawed Christianity after he blamed them for the destruction of Rome. 
When Paul was brought to Rome, he was imprisoned under a personal guard. For the next two years, Paul stayed under house arrest, living in his own house at his own expense, but chained to a soldier. Now, the soldier was changed every eight hours, so Paul had at least one person as a captive audience. Some of these soldiers eventually became Christians and are referred to as the saints in Caesar's household. While he was in this house, Jews came to visit him and asked him to explain more about his understanding of the Messiah. There were many people in Rome who were Christians. Priscilla and Aquila lived in Rome, and Phoebe led part of the church here. It is probable that Paul was released after two years following a successful first hearing. There is some evidence that in 62 AD the Emperor Nero, in an act of clemency, released numerous prisoners who had not been brought to trial because of lack of prosecution witnesses. It is believed that during this first imprisonment, Paul wrote the letters to the Colossians, the Philippians and to Philemon. It is also probable that what became the basis for the letter to the Ephesians was also written during this imprisonment. Paul probably had two years of freedom, in which Rome was used as a base for his ministry. There was plenty of opportunity for Paul to preach the gospel here. There were one million people in the city, half of them slaves, all of them living within a 20-kilometer area. It was expensive to live in the heart of the city, but a gift brought by Epaphroditus from Philippi helped Paul pay his way. Paul probably stayed in one of the large tenement buildings. Some of them were so large they were called islands. Shops and offices filled the ground floor, and people lived for at least seven stories above. It was common to have to climb 200 stairs to get to the top story apartment. Like today, Rome was crowded with people. People from all over the empire came to see Rome. Tradition has it that Paul visited Spain from here, a country that had been one of his prime objectives for many years. While Paul lived in freedom in Rome, he helped strengthen the church. But Rome was soon to become a living hell for the early Christians, as Nero sought to blame them for the fire of 64 AD. There's probably no more place on earth that symbolizes the trouble of the early Christians than right here on the floor of the Colosseum. Here they were martyred, they were mocked, their blood was shed for the sport of crowds of people that mocked them and jeered them. And many of them, I'm sure, really wondered, were they worthy to be called the sons of God? Paul wrote to the Corinthians a very important passage about it. He encouraged people to realize that there was nothing that could happen in this life. There was no disgrace that could be brought upon them by other people or what they did themselves that would really disqualify them as the sons of God. In fact, he said to them, do you not know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? That neither shall thieves, nor drunkards, nor idolaters, nor homosexuals, nor perverts, nor thieves, nor robbers, nor anyone else like this will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you have been washed, you have been cleansed, you have been sanctified, made holy. He said they had been made one with the saints. There was no trouble that could ever come upon them that would make them unworthy as children of God. And in this place, that gave encouragement to the believers in times of trial. The second problem the Apostle Paul faced was that when people were dragged in here to die for sport before the crowds, it was only natural that they should fear death. And Paul addressed himself to this concern that people had out of fear of death. Frequently he wrote to encourage them that even in times of death, God was able to save them. When he died, being beheaded here in Rome just before the Colosseum was built, he wrote to young Timothy saying, the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight, I have run the race, and henceforth there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness which no man can take from me. Probably his most encouraging letter was to the Christians, however, here in Rome, where he wrote to them about what death really means. He said, what can separate us from the love of Christ? 
shall death or life or angels or principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth no he said I am persuaded that there is nothing in all of creation that is able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord so Paul in a very beautiful way made it clear in time of death God is able to say The life of Paul the Apostle, the greatest missionary who has ever lived, started in Tarsus and was about to end 68 years later here in Rome. Paul's life had gone through a dramatic turnaround and it was now about to come to a grand finale. In 64 AD, Paul was taken out of the city of Rome and beheaded. On the traditional spot where this was done, there now stands the church, St. Paul's, outside the walls. This is the last episode of our series, Discovering Paul. Over the past 11 episodes, we've seen Paul as a prisoner, as a philosopher, a preacher and a prophet. We've seen him as a pastor caring for the churches, as a patriot who cared about his Jewish background. We've looked at Paul as a proud Pharisee and a persecutor who tried to stamp out the Christian message. Paul as a protagonist, a pioneer and a proclaimer. The life of Paul as we know it from the New Testament covered a span of some 16 years. In those 16 years, Paul changed the history of the world. From the moment of his conversion on the road to Damascus, Paul knew he would come here in chains to Rome some 30 years later. He accepted his imprisonment because Paul knew that this would serve to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ. In our last episode, we looked at Paul as a prisoner in Rome, the traditional site of which is the Mamantinum prison. It was here that tradition says Peter was also in prison. Now we finish discovering Paul by looking at him as a person. <laughs> 
so the Apostle Paul came to Rome, not as he had planned, but in chains. He was tried on two occasions. After the first trial, he was apparently released, and then there was a second trial. But then in 64 AD occurred the great fire of Rome. The Senate needed some scapegoats. Nero had fiddled while Rome had burnt, and so they called out for blood. And of course, Nero found blood in the very first Christians. It was under his persecution that both the apostles, Peter and Paul, were executed. Just before his final trial, he wrote to young Timothy and said, the time of my departure is at hand. I have run the race. I have fought the good fight. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which no man can take from me. And then he said very simply, the grace of the Lord be with you. And so the most noble Christian life of all was coming to an end. No man made a greater impact for the Christian faith than the Apostle Paul. The time of my departure is at hand, he said. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. These are the ruins of the Forum, the center of the Roman Empire. It was the Roman Empire that enabled Paul to be so effective in his ministry. As a citizen of the empire, Paul was able to travel freely from Jerusalem, through Asia Minor, into Macedonia, and down into Greece and beyond. Looking back over the life of Paul, we can see that Paul lived a complete life. Despite suffering from a debilitating ailment and a not very handsome appearance, Paul made the most of every opportunity he had and never allowed personal weakness to hamper him. As we've followed his footsteps in this series, We've seen the rugged terrain over which he had to travel, the many rough ocean voyages he made, and the thousands of kilometers he had to walk. Paul had enormous physical reserves, matched only by a resolute will and great personal strength of character, all of which were finely tuned to serving the Lord Jesus Christ. The key to Paul's experience was that he, in his own words, was in Christ. Paul's Jewish heritage, his Roman citizenship, and his knowledge of Greek culture gave him the training he needed to be an effective minister of the gospel. Although back here in Jerusalem, just after Christ's death, Paul was more concerned about persecuting the young church. The Sanhedrin was the supreme civil and legal court under the first century Jewish system. There was no higher body in the land and Paul, as a very young man, was elected to this. This was a very significant appointment. He was elected because of his zealousness. He was wanting to make sure that all liberal elements within the world of the Jewish faith were being stamped out at that time. He was therefore a persecutor of the Hellenists and determined to stamp out all heretics. And it was under this approach of stamping out heretics that he decided that he would persecute the people that were known as the followers of the way. That was the terminology that was used of Christians in those days. And despite the worst of the persecutions that came, God decided to intervene. And in the worst of those times, God came in a very special way, in a way that Paul was not expecting, on a road to Damascus. And there it was that he made his will known to him. So a large convoy of armed troops set out, and at the front of them was Saul, armed with the authority of the chief priests and the elders to arrest any that they found of the way of Jesus and to bring them bound back to prison in Jerusalem. They went along the hot, stony desert way, 
north of Palestine to Damascus in Syria. It was there on the desert road toward Damascus that there was to occur what in all of recorded history is one of the most dramatic accounts of human conversion ever known. Saul needed to be helped up from the ground, for his eyes had been blinded by the light. Quietly and humbly, he was led into Damascus, where for three days he was unable to eat or drink. Saul's life was absolutely shattered, but out of that, a new man was to emerge. This was the start of a new life for Saul, or Paul, as he now became known. After Paul's conversion, everything was different. Paul was now in Christ. Instead of persecuting people of the way, he became a proclaimer, a preacher, and a pastor of those early Christians. Paul embarked upon some of the most remarkable journeys ever undertaken by man. These days, it's relatively easy to get to places like Ephesus in modern Turkey. But the apostle Paul walked thousands of kilometers over some of the roughest terrain imaginable. He endured hardships and disabilities. Why? Because he was in Christ. Paul centered much of his ministry here in Ephesus. This Roman city was the center of Roman administration for all of Asia Minor. Paul established the church here, and while here, he preached in a number of places. He would always go to the synagogue and tell the Jews about the life-changing message of Jesus Christ. He held meetings in private homes, the first house churches. He preached in the open air, but he had great success by using a public hall. Renting a public hall from Tyrannus or someone else like that certainly had several advantages. It meant that Paul could be in one place at one time, people would know that he would be there, and they would come on a regular basis. Paul was very successful. We read that he argued and he debated and he discussed and large crowds of people came. So much so that the sale in the little silver statuettes of Artemis declined and that caused trouble. Now, what was Paul arguing and discussing about? He'd spoken firstly about the righteousness of God. Now he speaks about the true nature of man, what some people have called the depravity of man. In essence, this simply means that man is utterly powerless to do what he wants to do. The fact is that all of us fall short of being what we ought to be. And something in our nature means that we cannot be what we know we ought to be. This inability of mankind to do something to make a difference to himself, to make him become what he wants to be and what he ought to be as opposed to what he is, was demonstrated very clearly in the letter that Paul wrote to the church at Rome. In the first and second chapters of Romans, he illustrates man's inability to overcome his environment and his heredity. Chuck Colson, who was with President Nixon in the White House, recalls how while he was in prison, President Nixon resigned. Looking at the whole scene from prison, Chuck told me very simply this. I suddenly realized that even presidents could be gripped by the weakness of their own humanity. Even presidents. You see, there's nothing about it that we can do by ourselves and for ourselves. Faith is essential for our salvation. This is Athens. 
Paul's. In Paul's day, the most famous city in the world for philosophy and culture. Paul came here on his second missionary journey, coming down from Berea and Macedonia. As Paul looked round at the architecture and heard the philosophers talking in the marketplace or agora, he knew that what he had experienced through the person of Jesus Christ was far more real and relevant than the strange and obscure arguments the Athenian philosophers discussed. Because he had a new idea to present, he was invited to address the city council on Mars Hill. Some was setting on the Greek Empire when the Apostle Paul came here to Athens. But when he came to Athens, into the home of Socrates and Plato, Xenophon, Aristotle, he came to the most brilliant philosophic minds of the era and spoke about the Christian faith. Here was a Jew who was a Roman citizen coming into the midst of the Greek Empire arguing about philosophy. What an achievement! But there was even a greater achievement behind it when we consider his life. First of all, Paul was the best educated of all the early Christians, and therefore there was an intellectual capacity he gave to the Christian faith. He traveled to more cities than any other believer in the early church, and left behind a string of churches right across the known empire. He was the foremost evangelist that the church had, and structured a missionary strategy that penetrated the known world. And of course, he was a great theologian. He took the statements of the Christian faith, of the incarnation, of the death and resurrection of Jesus, and gave them meaning and substance. And every theologian ever since has had to deal with the theology of the Apostle Paul. Paul was the man who took the Christian faith from a Jewish sect on the fringe of the empire and turned it into a worldwide religion. He was the one who trained leaders, preachers, teachers, who established the churches right across the known world. And he wrote letters, perhaps scores of letters of which we have at least a dozen, from prisons in Ephesus and Caesarea and Rome. And he sent them to the most influential churches of the early world. Those letters in turn were to become the most influential epistles ever to be known in the history of mankind. What an achiever, that Apostle Paul. But apart from the mission of Paul to the Gentiles, Paul also had a mission to the Jews, to his own people. And it was here in the temple, and also in synagogues around the world, that Paul taught the history and philosophy, the prophecy and the scriptures of the Jewish people. Probably no one traveled as extensively as Paul to preach among the network of synagogues around the world how Jesus Christ was really the Messiah. Today the Jewish people are still waiting for the coming of the Messiah. All things then will be complete when the Messiah comes. Frequently the Jewish people today speak about when the Messiah comes. But Paul made it very clear that when the time was ready, he said, God sent forth his son born of a woman. The Messiah has already come. God was in Jesus Christ reconciling the world to himself. This city of Jerusalem will see the Messiah come again, but his second coming will be with glory and power. 
Paul echoed the prophet Isaiah when he talked about Christ returning to establish his kingdom here on earth. More than anything else, Paul wanted his fellow Jews to be like him, a fulfilled Jew, a complete person in Christ. But the authorities imprisoned Paul after his third missionary journey, and he was taken to Rome as a prisoner. Downtown Rome is noisy and bustling, and here at the Colosseum, it's a great place for tourists. But it wasn't a great place for tourists, nor a popular place in the first century. It was here that thousands of Christians were martyred. The Apostle Paul, after three years of imprisonment, and then release, and then imprisonment again, was taken outside the city walls and beheaded. There was something ironic in the fact that, like his master. He was despised and rejected of men and taken outside the city walls and executed. But as God had been with him on the Damascus Road in prisons and riots and shipwreck, so God was with him even in the time of death. His death was not that of a failure. In fact, his death liberated his life and his teachings and the gospel spread throughout the world. Nero had found his scapegoats, but he also discovered a great truth, that you couldn't stop the gospel message, because what had happened was that the blood of the martyrs had become the seed of the church. And in that spirit of truth and freedom, the gospel spread throughout the known world. The influence of Paul's life didn't end when his did, back in 64 AD. Down through the centuries, Paul's writings have influenced many people. Almost every great movement in the history of the church has been brought about by a rediscovery of the significance of the New Testament, and in particular, the letters of Paul. In the 15th century, a Roman monk, Martin Luther, ascended these stairs in the Santa Scala Church in Rome on his knees. The stairs are said to be from the house of Pilate in Jerusalem and are the stairs that Christ climbed when Pilate tried him. Climbing these stairs on your knees was a way of earning God's favour, or so Luther was told. It was only when Luther read Paul's letter to the Romans that he understood that the only way to receive God's forgiveness was through faith in Jesus Christ. Luther's grasping of Paul's words was to start the Reformation. In May 1738, John Wesley wrote that as he read Luther's introduction to Paul's Book of the Romans, he felt his heart strangely warmed. I felt an assurance, Wesley said, that Christ had indeed taken away my sins and cleansed me from the law of sin and death. How can we adequately assess the contemporary significance of Paul? His theology is basic to all that is Christian. His life has inspired generations. Whenever Paul has been rediscovered and his writings read afresh, there has been a new outbreak of evangelism and witness to the faith in Christ. The early church gave their verdict on the life of Paul by collecting his letters and writings and recognizing them as being inspired by God. Paul is the outstanding ambassador for Christ, pointing always to his master and Lord.